Salam alaikum, everybody. Thank you for joining. Thank you for staying. Um, we know it's been a long evening. I hope you've enjoyed it so far. Um, my name is Dina. I'm a first generation Christian Palestinian living in the diaspora here in um, the Bay Area. I'm also one of the co-founders of Soul of My Soul exhibit. Okay. Uh, before we move forward, I'd like to take a moment of silence to honor our martyrs and all those affected by the illegal Israeli occupation of Palestine. Thank you, everyone. Um, so tonight we have a wonderful pal um, panel of Palestinian Americans here from your local community, and um, they are here to share their stories of living in the diaspora, living under occupation, um, and basically their experiences um, as Palestinian Americans. We have a short bio of each of them. Um, so let's see. We'll start with Yas. Okay. Um, Yas is originally from the West Bank and was born and raised in the diaspora. He's an entrepreneur in high tech and medical transportation services, an activist for peace and justice for Palestine, and founder of Project Hope for Palestine. Thank you for coming. Okay. Sabrina uh, Shahada was born and raised in a refugee camp in East Jerusalem. She graduated with a master's in journalism from Al Quds University, also in Jerusalem. Sabrina was a teacher for 10 years before moving to the Bay Area with her husband and three children. Chemistry. Chemistry. I'm sorry. Okay. Fadia, um, Fadia Hijazi was born and raised in the diaspora here in the Bay Area as well. She's a former lecturer at San Jose State University with experience in biostatistics and pharmaceutical research. Fadia's family is native to Gaza and is currently <sighs> surviving the genocide as best as they can. And my cousin Nora, Nora Khoury was born in the diaspora, currently residing on Ohlone land in Oakland. For two decades, she's been a community organizer and serves on the National Committee of Al Auda, the Palestinian Right to Return Coalition. Nora also lived for several years in Palestine and Egypt, where she witnessed the devastating impacts of US foreign policy in the region. Thank you, everyone, for joining. All right, so I'd like to start with Sabrina. Um, you're the only one on the panel who was actually born and raised in Palestine in East Jerusalem under occupation. So if you could just tell us a little bit about some formative experiences that you have had. Yeah, sure. Uh, oh, yeah. that's a good idea. Um, as alaikum, everybody. Uh, my name is Sabrina, and I'm a Palestinian. Uh, born in Palestine, and I would like to start by saying, pointing out that every Palestinian uh, carries a burden, and every Palestinian has a story to tell, because each one of us have been affected uh, by the Israeli occupation. So my story is not unique uh, in any way. Uh, I was born in Palestine. Uh, my family comes from um, a small village, called uh, Bir Ma'in. Uh, their village, along with 530 other Palestinian villages, were completely destroyed, um, attacked by the Zionist uh, militia in 1948. Um, so my family was dis displaced, uh, along with 750,000 Palestinians who lost their homes. And this is how um, I ended up growing up in a refugee camp in east of Jerusalem. Um, let me put on my glasses. Um, born under occupation, growing up in a refugee camp takes away the sense of security and the sense of what is normal. It can force you to grow before your years and robs you from your childhood. So you are a refuge 
in your own country. You were assigned a refugee and UNRWA refugee card. You grew up in an overcrowded camp, a small piece of land, limited resources. Uh, there's no parks for your kids to play. There's no fields for them to run. There is no room to breathe. But yet, it does not end there. So today, I'll be sharing with you some of the stories that my family and I went through uh, and still going through under the Israeli occupation. Three girls, and uh, I'm the youngest, and one boy, that's my brother, and my second youngest, and my mom. Uh, my mom raised us after my dad uh, passed away when we were very young. Today, today I'll be focusing on my brother, Ahmed. Um, he was the only boy in the house, and um, you know, I'm just going to tell you what he had to go through uh, under the Israeli occupation. So Ahmed is the quiet boy, and he kept it all to himself, never threw a rock, never protested against the Israeli occupation. My mom was overprotective of him because he was the only boy in the house. So um, I'm going to be talking about the regular Israeli raids, assaults, and the kidnapping of children. The main purpose of these raids in the West Bank and occupied East Jerusalem is to terrorize, make their presence felt, send a clear message of who is in charge, um, and give uh, the Palestinian children a taste of what life would be like inside Israeli prisons. So my brother Ahmed, who was just a child, never threw a rock, remember, at the Israeli occupation, was kidnapped three times from three different places, places that should be safe. He was kidnapped from home. So at any time, day or night, Israeli forces armed Israeli forces can kick down your front door, invade your privacy, ransack your house, assault you, and kidnap your kids. As we were getting ready for lunch, my mom and us kids, my mom had made luchia. I don't know if you guys know what luchia is, but she made luchia that day. And we were getting ready to have lunch. So we can hear a loud bang on the front door. So right away we knew we have to figure out where should we hide my brother, who was just 11. We decided to sneak him out to the house across the alley. So we lived on the second floor. So we used a piece of wood to build a bridge between the neighbor's window and our window, and there he goes. So we took that risk, thinking he won't be arrested that day hoping he won't be taken that day. But unfortunately, he was, because minutes after, the Israeli occupation raided the neighbor's house, and he was taken along with the neighbor's two boys. Now Ahmed is kidnapped from the street, as my brother and I were walking home. From school, uh, minutes away from home, we noticed empty streets, and we can hear a car behind us. So we look behind us and we see an Israeli um, armed vehicle uh, speeding up toward us. And then four Israeli soldiers jumped out of that vehicle and snatched my brother, shoved him around and kicked him inside their vehicle. And he was taken. I will never forget the look on his face. I froze in that moment. It feels like the world stopped spinning. Even though I was only nine, I still feel guilty for being helpless and not being able to protect my brother. From school, this time Ahmed is in high school. He attended high school, uh, it's called uh, Rashidiya High School, which is in occupied Jerusalem, a few miles away from our home, the refugee camp. So we get the news that the school has been raided, surrounded by Israeli forces, and they're firing tear gas inside the school and arresting the kids. My mom is terrified. She rushes to the school to find out that he was taken to the Israeli detention center. So my mom is very stubborn. She goes to the detention center, 
and she camps outside the Israeli detention center, refusing to leave until they let him go. And they did, they let him go, because they have nothing to charge him with. Now I would like to tell you about the lethal force used against Palestinian children. Being a Palestinian child living under occupation also means that your life is worthless. You could be shot and killed at any moment for no reason. No Israeli soldier will be charged or held accountable. In fact, they can get rewarded, praised, and called heroes. Last Ramadan, Israel Security Minister Ben Gavir praised the Israeli soldier and called him a hero for shooting dead a 12-year-old boy who was playing in front of his home with his friends in our refugee camp. In July 1990, one of my brother Ahmed's best friends, his name was Mundir Dabit, a 14-year-old boy shot dead for throwing a rock at the Israeli armed uh, vehicle during one of the raids to the refugee camp. So these are few of endless stories, just to allow you to get a sense of what is it like to live under Israeli occupation. I don't have enough time to tell you about the time that I got shot by a rubber bullet when I was walking to my uncle's house, or time to talk about my dear uncle who lost two of his children shot dead by Israeli occupation forces, or the restriction of movement, the endless harassments um, at the Israeli occupation point. How the occupation interferes with your life decision making, like what school should your kids go to, or uh, where should you live, or who to marry, or how you can lose your residency. Simply, you can't live in Palestine just if you, if you leave the country for um, th more than three years. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Sabrina. That was very powerful. And um, I think it's really noteworthy to point out that two of the three times your brother was arrested, he was a child. And oh, the yeah. third time also in high, high school, school still, a still a child. Um, it's, it's absolutely incredible mm. um, and awful. Um, Fadia, so your family is, you have lots of family still living in Gaza. Yeah. Some here, some there. Yeah. And I know you visited several times as a child. Mm -hmm. um, so if you want to share some of that, what's that, what that was like for you? Yes, inshallah. Salaam alaikum, everyone. Um, thank you for uh, having this uh, event and welcoming us. And thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, just uh, a few things I'll, I'll discuss. Um, there's only so much you can say, you know, in a, a period, you know, in a gathering. Uh, lots of stories to share, uh, competing, you know, priorities <laughs> to share. Right now, I'm going to focus on the genocide that we're witnessing in Gaza. Um, as you all know, what's happening in Gaza right now. Um, like many of my other friends from Gaza, they have family there as well. I have my mostly uh, some of my father's side and my mother's side. Uh, three, uh, my three paternal, uh, three maternal uncles, my three khalos, are in Gaza, and my youngest khala, she's my mom's youngest sister, she's there as well. They're all in the Khan Yunus uh, Mawasi region. There, they all had beautiful homes. They had. Uh, Three-story homes, really fancy, nicer than the homes we have here, and uh, they're all gone. Mm -hmm. They're now, as you know, living in tents, and we try to support them. We try to be some sort of lifeline to them. Uh, you know, God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's the lifeline for them, but we tr do our, our part to help support them. Uh, it's going to be a lifelong thing that we have to deal with and uh and we're just worried about them uh i get heartbroken when like my uncle will send me a whatsapp voice clip once every maybe three weeks he's 78 and he'll just ask me how i'm doing we're good alhamdulillah everyone's khair. and he's talking so like so 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 much iman so much so much um faith and happy and he don't worry about us we're okay and i like i know they're not okay but you know but I, you know, sent him a message that I'm happy to hear that. May Allah give you as patience and whatnot. So it's really hard for the last year and a half to have been almost, well, a little over a year to be experiencing this for us um, here. Emotionally, it's been, you know, traumatic. But when we see what they're going through, how can we complain, right? They're going through so much. Um, 
So uh, my uncle, my youngest uncle, he's very dear to me. He visited us here when I was younger. I visited, uh, like you mentioned, uh, uh, when I was 8, 13, 17, and 22. Those are very formative years. Those are very like impactful years in my life to have been able to go see culture, see family. I love them so much. My uncle, uh, he uh, actually taught at the Islamic University of Gaza. He taught at the... Uh, English department and he took me to the campus. I remember when I was a teenager, he took me, I uh, gave me a tour of the campus and I was so excited to go with him during one of our visits. Uh, and now it's gone, as you know. There is no more, there are no more universities in Gaza left. They've all been destroyed. Uh, these are institutions. And uh, it was uh, crazy. The other day, my sister was at an event in, in San Francisco, a Palestinian event, and there was this, I guess, uh, well-known poet. His name is Mus'ab Abu Toha. He's a well-known uh, poet. He's been, I guess, touring. And so she was talking to him, and he asked her, what's your last name? And then she told him, and, um, and she told him my, our mom's side. And then he said, oh, my, do you know so-and-so? And -so? I, I don't want to share my uncle's name. Sorry. I'm just, like, scared. <laughs> we have to protect our, our the important people in our uh, communities because they, they, they get targeted, you know, the doctors, the PhDs. So uh, she, uh, she said, that's my uncle. And then she, she started crying. She said, that's my uncle. You know him? He said he was the one who inspired me to be a poet. He is my professor at the Islamic University of Gaza and in the English department, and he's the one that inspired me. And I didn't even know my uncle had that impact. I mean, I knew he was, mashallah, like, you know, a PhD in Eng British literature. He went to England, and he, you know, like so many other Palestinians. But to kind of just put the pieces of the puzzle together and see, like, the, you know, is I just, I don't have words anymore to to complain anymore about what's going on. I just want this to end. I want our family not to worry about getting bombed anymore. Um, I'm, I've lost over 100 relatives from my extended family. Uh, that doesn't take much. It just takes like, you know, four or five buildings, then there's 100 people. So we've lost a lot of family members. Uh, my husband, he's also here. He's from North Gaza. He still has family there. Um, surviving in Shajaiya region. It's uh, unfathomable what they're experiencing in North Gaza, um, uh, in all of Gaza, really. So uh, I'm just hoping one day the siege is, is lifted, and I know it maybe it's a fantasy in my head. I don't know what the future holds. I just pray to God that this nightmare ends, and inshallah, one day I'm able to go and visit my family. I haven't seen them since I was 22, and I'm now I'm in my mid-upper 40s, and that's a long time. I have ch three children that have never met their relatives, and I don't want to lose that connection, that cultural connection. I don't. I, I my my kids have only known Palestine through videos, TV, WhatsApp, and what we've told them, and I, I they never got to go visit. And I don't want it to happen for another generation or two. So. That's all I'm going to say right now. I think I'll stop because I have so many stories to share of, you know, family trauma, imprisonments, people, you know, um, being uh, unjustly treated. But thank you for your time, and inshallah, I uh, look forward to hearing the other speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Fadia. So I, I think it's just really interesting and, and unique to point out that your family is indigenous to Gaza. Yes. So a yeah. lot of those living in Gaza, like my family in the north, um, were refugees from 48, from 67. Um, but I think you're the first Palestinian I've met that, mm -hmm. is, that is indigenous. I'll just add one thing that, yeah, so... About 70 to 80 percent of Gaza are refugees from 1948, right? So my family is not. We're actually from there. We're indigenous. Our our, vi our village uh, is, is named Beni Suhaila. It's uh, just east of Khan Yunis, and that whole area east of Khan Yunis is actually very indigenous. That area, and it's hard because actually my uncle had a chance to get evacuated earlier on when they were doing evacuations, and. He, he was just debating. He, he didn't end up going. It was a hard decision for him because he didn't want to leave his other kids that are married and grandchildren. And so he ended up staying. And so he had the choice to leave. But, you know, if our, our if he leaves, then, you know, if everyone leaves, then no one stays, right? And then our village will become depopulated too. It'll join the list of other Palestinian uh, villages that have been depopulated. So they stay there in that state hoping to go back to their land and, and you know, 
it's like you know you're part of the roots <laughs> of the land so inshallah when they're day. they're the backbone of our existence and i hope and pray that they feel all of our support and energy always because we we put it out there um they're the ones who they're the ones who keep it going. Um, also interesting the way you spoke about really how Palestinian society is so fragmented through the diaspora, through 48, through 67. Um, and I know, Ias, you wanted to speak to that a little bit, having been born outside of Palestine and not able to return for some time. Hello. Uh, my name is Ias. And like uh, Dina said, um, I'm a Palestinian born in the diaspora. I come from the West Bank. And, God, it's so always not so easy to speak about what's happening in Palestine. I actually cried in the movie. Um, so, yeah, I'm born in the diaspora. I have family in the West Bank. I remember one of the things, I mean, I visited when I was a child, but um, I remember meeting my uncle for the first time when I was 40 years old, and uh, we hugged, and we both cried for... Um, I would say, like, long, long, many minutes. Um, I also like to put things in perspective when it matters, so I like to joke around and say, like, people, when they speak to people and they meet them for the first time and they ask them, like, where are you from? The answer is one word, a name of one country. For us, it's a story. Mm -hmm. You have to, especially if you if meet a Palestinian, mm -hmm. it's like... Are you 67 or 48? And it's like, no, you actually, Jerusalem is part of it is 67. That's where my mom is. And my dad is from, you know, the 48 side. And, you know, they moved, like, you know, the Huris. Um, they moved to Berzeit. And then, you know, and for example, she mentioned the, um, the Gaza um, is 70% refugees. It is so interesting that some villages that some of them, now I work with Gaza, I mean, very, like, you know, closely, because I have a, a campaign, it's called Project Over Palestine, and we're actually on the ground in Gaza. There are from areas that are minutes from my village. And I keep telling people, like, when they probably, they don't care. It's like, I could have been one of those being bombed. I don't know why the Haganah stopped just minutes before they went into Sarta, my town. Um, so, yeah, and back to be, you being indigenous, um, because well, I speak with as I know it by heart now, and it's like, oh, are you going to the Hamad uh, area? It's like, and there's like, oh, you're just like living with us. Um, they call it like Muatlan and Muhajir, like the indigenous, they call it Muatlan, like citizen. Muhajir is the, um, refugee. Refugee. kind of like, it's not exactly means like refugee, like Lajir. Okay. The immigrant, yeah. And also, whenever I have the chance, I would like to um, put also things in perspective. Like, Palestine is small. It's 27,000 uh, square kilometers. And, like, the towns literally are minutes away from each other. But because of the ongoing Nakba that started, of course, in the late 1947s throughout 1948, and people think, they say, oh, the Nakba of 1948, well, the ethnic cleansing continued throughout the 1949 to 50, 51, 52. And so let me tell you, like, about a million and a half inhabitants of Palestine. Now we have so many different um, experiences and so many different um, places that we live and so for example you have the people um who were like um her um sabrine her family um lost their homes and they were ethnically cleansed in the 1948 and became what people call right now israel uh, there's still remaining about two million people that are living as second class citizens of israel not even second i would say probably 10 you know class uh, citizens of israel um, and then you have the refugees that um, ended up in Lebanon refugee camps, uh, West Bank refugee camps, Gaza refugee camps, Syria, and Jordan. You have now the West Bank and Gaza and East Jerusalem that's still considered internationally as the occupied territories. So they're probably going to change soon under Trump. Um, uh, so you have Jerusalem 
was annexed in 1980 by Israel and they decided it's part of Israel proper. Um, these guys were given IDs, so they're not even, they're not Palestinians and then they're Israelis, they have a Jerusalem ID. I think you have it, right? Yeah. It's a document that allows you to travel or not? It's like, uh, you know the green card? Like a, it's like, a res like you're resident there. So you have to pay taxes, you know, to the Israeli government. You do get medical uh, benefits and, and stuff like that. But you can't vote. And you're not a citizen. So if you, like m me, I have the American citizenship. If they find out that I have it, they'll take away my ID. We call it an ID, which is the blue ID. So you are free to travel around, but you can't live outside the Jerusalem restriction. So when I got married, I moved to the West Bank. So I was so scared for them to find out because my ID would be taken because I work in Jerusalem, so I have to commute every day from the West Bank to the J Jerusalem. And if they, they know about it, then uh, they'll take away my ID and I can't visit Jerusalem. I can't, be, I can't live in Jerusalem. I can't, my family lives in Jerusalem. It's a very intricate apartheid yeah. system oh, yeah. that is, is so institutionalized and documented. I, you know, people in the West don't necessarily understand that, but our IDs, our Hawiyas, even the license plates on our cars, uh, it all determines the access that we have to our ancestral land. Um, and, you know, it's apartheid. Um, yeah, so... Um, I just wanted to finish off like, and of course we now have the West Bank and Gaza. West Bank is under military occupation since 1967, like a complete apartheid military occupation. Gaza was like that until 2005 when they pulled out, but they came back again starting from 2007 and they put it under blockade and now back to a military occupation. Um, so a million and a half people. Uh, back in 1948, now we have so many IDs fragmented, live all over the place. Of course, there's the people like who live in the United States, Europe, and uh, South America, the Gulf area, and um, yeah, that's the uh, result of the um, pr uh, Israeli project, basically. So, Nora, I know um, here we ask. Um, I know you lived in Palestine. Um, fairly recently, like the last maybe 30 years or so. Um, can you tell us about what that was like? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm still emotional from that film. I think it was just so powerful to see, um, you know, what life is like daily before October 7th. Like, just the level of injustice um, is so overwhelming. And those were in better times, you know, like... It's just um, just unthinkable to imagine how people survive under these circumstances. And, um, you know, like, I never grew up going back. I was born here in the U.S., and our family, you know, wasn't able to go back. We're from um, El Uts, Jerusalem, and my father's side from Birzit. Um, and um, it's just, you know was something that was over there and I studied like international relations in college and um, it was a much more hopeful time you know we talk about ongoing Nekba and um, you know there's a fast genocide of the Nekba 48 and that accelerated again in 67 um, and then we saw again in 2001 with the second intifada the largest you know the highest re levels of violence we've seen probably since 67 and you know I truly was just shocked and amazed that like now we have access to information and um, the whole world is watching while they're bulldozing old people in their homes and other people that can't leave Janine and you know other uh, places that had the resistance was strong and so um, I was you know it was a very prosperous time economically in the US and so I was doing well but um, after 9-11 happened and I saw they were using that as a pretext to you know demolish uh, Palestine then um, I just dropped everything and you know committed myself to the change I wanted to be uh, to see and so um, I 
heard about ISM, the International Solidarity Movement, and for the first time, there was something physically we could do to maybe not stop the violence, but to slow it down, to use our bodies, to intervene, to use our privilege. As Americans, um, you know, with a passport, it's like gold there. And, you know, they're going to think twice. They're not going to not attack us. We all heard what happened to Rachel Corey, the girl, the young woman that was, you know, killed by the bulldozer in Rafa for trying to defend a home in 2001, long before, you know, um, Hamas took over and October 7th happened. So all of these stories are, you know, completely um, common, Re whether we resist, whether we resist, um, you know, with arms, whether we resist nonviolently, they come after us all. And I think that is really important to know. Um, there's been so many, you know, um, MLKs and Gandhis, people always say, where's the nonviolent, you know, um, Palestinians and they're either killed or they're, um, you know, murder, uh, or jailed, or jailed, exiled, or, or murdered. Exactly. And they've been doing that since 48. Right. So, you know, um, it has made a big difference. I think, you know, just as Gabor Mate said, like, you know, just witnessing, standing, accompanying Palestinians, being there to witness, you know, to listen to their stories um, and, you know, do every single person says, like, go home and tell everyone what you witnessed here. And that's their only request. Um, and so, yeah, just... Um, uh, like spent the last 20 years trying to, you know, do whatever I can to like do advocacy work, direct action, um, you know, fundraising, whatever to send, um, to, to, to support our resistance here. And so, um, you know, after October 7th, uh, the call came again from Palestine to go, um, to, Pal to, um, stand with Palestinians again. Now they had completely taken out the, you know, they had really active popular committees in all the villages, as you saw Basim Tamimi, our most beloved community leader, they had to torture him and humiliate him and take him out. And it just broke all of our hearts, like nothing else, like the most beautiful, principled, strong leaders, like they go after them first. And um, so I went back this year, um, I was in Masafayatta, which they showed in the film and, you know, with the Bedouin, just like grazing the land with the sheep. And um, it was really so ex special to be on the land again, you know, after all this time. Um, I was also in Kusra, which is a village where south of Nablus. And, um, you know, these are the families that are the last remaining strong, holding strong on the land, you know, where the settlers meet. Um, just the front lines where the settlers come and terrorize like we were in the house there were seven houses burnt down um you know like up until our house and that's where the internationals stay and they tremendously desperately need uh, folks to come and join um there's a campaign called feza um the website is defendpalestine.org and um there's resources to help get people there plane tickets if that's something that you um feel called to do um but you know there's there's other ways to get involved like you know, they've been attacking this movement as well and trying, you know, Ben Gavir just put out a task force to send, um, you know, uh, foreigners back because it makes, it makes a difference. It really does, um, you know, affect the way that um, they're able to move. And so they'll move into a different place. But imagine if we had like, you know, um, just hundreds of, of thousands of people coming to stand, you know, and to witness and to use our, our privilege. Um, these are our tax dollars. This is our weapons. And we have a duty and a responsibility to do everything we can um, to be there. And so, yeah, being there, yeah, I was able to do um, that and also learn about human rights law, international law, and uh, campaigning. And so I was able to use that to integrate into my work here and my advocacy and um, just being there on the ground is so important to be able to reflect, you know, the reality in ways that you get, um, like, even people listen more to, to what you're saying. And um, as, as far as, um, you know, political leaders or whatever, even though they don't do anything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you got to keep up the pressure. <laughs> Thank you for that.
Um, I think that's an excellent call to action. So thank you for that. It's a good segue into, into our final question. I know we're running short on time. Um, so Nora, you really spoke about uh, bearing witness and actually physically going there. And, and that's a fantastic thing that anyone could really do if, if that appeals to you. Um, let's see. We'll start with the yes. Like, what would you like people here and your local community and the U.S. in general to do to help our cause? Yeah, first uh, I want to take also the chance to recognize our brothers and sisters in Lebanon. Yeah. They have suffered as well, not the first time. They have been suffering since um, probably the early 70s. Um, and uh, Beirut is, now you see the videos, you can't tell until you have to go Gaza or uh, south of Lebanon. So I need to recognize them and um, also, um, yeah, so back to the call of action. Also, one thing that I see a lot of people saying, but I'm this just one guy. What am I going to do? I mean, it could be anything from just posting something. Probably can walk in the neighborhood and maybe like purposely like put a pin and then strike a conversation. You can probably get a, a friendly conversation and you get an ally. And then you can tell them about... Um, ways that they can join the cause. There are so many now ad, ad hoc um, groups that you can uh, join on a local uh, level. You can donate. Um, basically, if you don't really know where to go, just find somebody that you know, maybe a Palestinian or somebody that can lead you to... Um, we have these papers to get started. Yes. And, um, yeah, and then... Maybe you can do what Nora and her friends are doing, just go to Palestine and um, just, what do they call it, like, protective presence? Yeah, I don't like that word. What, what do you like? I call it company. Because we're not going there to protect the people. We're going to stand with the people on their land. Sorry, could you repeat it again? Oh, um... People call it protective presence, but I feel like, yeah, that, that just feeds into like the white savior mentality, honestly. And um, there is like a uh, accompaniment that we do when we're standing with and beside Palestinians who can't reach their land. Um, but we're not we're not like, you know, superheroes or something. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Do you want to talk about how you'd like people to take action? Yeah, um, I guess first and foremost, I mean, there's a few things you can do. Uh, first of all, uh, keep Palestine number one in your prayers, okay? Uh, prayer is important. Uh, make dua for them. Uh, please keep speaking up for Palestine. Don't allow that they're trying to erase us and our our they they try to pretend we don't exist there's no such thing as a palestinian uh if they're trying to erase our identity don't allow them to do that we exist speak up for palestine advocate for palestine we need if, if we collectively keep the momentum going and keep the flame you know strong then it will carry on from to the next generation, but if we're all not putting up, putting in much effort, it will die down by the next generation. It's a collective effort. Um, so speak up for Palestine, advocate, uh, uh, network with people, join organizations. It's the best way you can do something. We're stronger in numbers. Join organizations, go to protests, do, do different things that make you feel like you're making a difference, and do also. Donate what you can. It doesn't ha necessarily have to be, you know, always a large amount. You just something consistent actually is more powerful than something, you know, one time. So, and Palestinians are going to be needing support financially for a very long time. So, for like literally for the next two decades, <laughs> uh, uh, at least. So, who knows how long? So, something consistent, small, doable over time would be very much appreciated. I just want to say something quick. Um, the most important thing is to educate. 
I start with yourself. This is what I had to do because I kept hearing, oh, Palestinian, uh, you, there's no such thing as Palestinians. As a Palestinian, I know, I know because my dad is older than the state of Israel. Okay, so I think of my grandfather and his, his dad and all that. So, but I, I had to go and learn for myself, even though I lived the occupation, but I've learned so much after October 7th. So much I did not know. Uh, about the Zionist regime, uh, the, the things they do, you know, like stealing uh, the organs of the Palestinian um, martyrs. Anyway, so please educate, if you like, educate yourself, educate your kids, your community, your neighbors, in, in a nice way, you know, I don't have to argue with anybody. I tell my kids, don't argue, don't argue, be nice, okay? Don't get angry, don't get, just be nice you know, and to get your message through. And then boycott, please, boycott. And just, you know, spread the word. Wear a Palestinian shirt, maybe. <laughs> Thank you. All right, let's say just add, uh, yeah, yeah, like uh, practical things we can do to boycott. Sorry, I know you have a question, but um, there's a few um, barcodes here that are, um, like they're trying to criminalize the charities and the organizations. We have like a handful in the country that we can um, that advocate for Palestine and they're trying to take those all down um, so we really need folks to they're trying to um, do it they had a vote last week they, they have a bill they have a bill HR right now that's supposed to be passed so we're asking everyone to please take a picture of the screen go home or right now uh, and just access the QR codes there's two bills in front of the government right now and yeah the Bernie yeah. Sanders one is so the one on the left is uh, Bernie Sanders put forth a resolution to stop the sale of even more weapons to Israel. So every single person should be signing this and Please, forwarding it to your contacts. Yeah, the very least. Um, and then the second one is they're bringing back a bill that was defeated. They're bringing it back to try to criminalize charities. Tomorrow morning. Yeah. yeah so please make sure you sign this um, tonight and send it to all your contacts. This is under the Democrats, by the way, FYI. So just get ready. Under Trump, it's going to be even worse. But um, at the local level, we're also doing um, boycott. There's an organization called Bad um, Bay Area Divest that's doing really great work on the local levels and the county and Oakland City Council. We were there last week, and then Alameda County Supervisors. Um, the Pleasanton is in Alameda County Supervisors District. So if you can go to Bay Area Divest, um, they're they're um, you know in need of like local folks to to go to your um, meetings and um, yeah just call for divestment there and so, we can work with you yeah too. if you follow bay area divest on instagram they will let you know when there are actions close to your city or applicable to you show up and yeah and sign if the you petitions can, and show up like help lead that effort you since your constituents of this district like we need more people in this area like we have all of our people are in oakland and berkeley yeah so um that's really important too so i just um I have, I have one last yeah thing. And I know uh, most eyes are on Gaza, and it's like the most dire, but I am from the West Bank, and I have I talk to them every day, and people on, in the West Bank are hurting too, um, with ways that, you know, the settler violence, and financially, they're struggling financially. So back on the donation thing, uh, please make it a habit. Talk to your friends and family, and spread the word. This is going to be uh, probably, we don't know yet, but it looks like it's going to get worse under Trump. So I think um, if we could just take really quick audience questions, please, if it's a statement, um, don't, only questions, just because of time. Um, did anyone have a question? Sabaya. Real quick. Yeah. Did you have one? Or? I, I'm curious if any of you are familiar with the organization Sorry. Uh, Sorry. Uh, Sorry. 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 in Berkeley called Mecca, yeah. uh, Middle East Children's um, Alliance. Right, and yesterday they did have a bazaar, and all proceeds uh, were for Gaza. And um, they do, they're on the ground in Gaza. Um, I, I believe the founder's name or the person that's currently in charge is Ziad Abbas. Right, no, uh, Ziad Abbas. And then there's Barbara Lubin. Well, she Barbara was the, Lubin yeah, the she was the original uh, founder, founder, I believe. And then. Um, Dr. Mona, uh, uh, Dr. Mona Farrah, I think, 
on the ground in Gaza. So they're a wonderful organization. Um, they do a lot for Gaza. Um, they have all kinds of events. You know, they're local. They're in Berkeley. Um, so that we're, would be... We're very aware of it. It's a great organization. They have a holiday boutique every year, which is what they just had. And we're a small group of us are actually looking at bringing that to the South Bay in the next few weeks to try to raise more money. So if you missed it up in Berkeley, stay tuned. Uh, keep your eye out on the Soul of My Soul exhibit website. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to bring it to the South Bay in the next few weeks. So if anyone has a quick question, otherwise, we'll just do closing announcements. This is kind of quick, but um, does anyone, I, I'm from Oakland, so I'm not as familiar, but Josh Harder is one of the Democrats who voted yes um, to the the killing um, nonprofit bill, that the one on the right there. Um, does anybody know him and can talk to him? I believe he's from... What's he's, his district? Yeah, where he, is he from? Um, it's He's a Democrat, Ninth California district, says his hometown is Tracy, so... So, oh, he's Central Valley. Oh, well, yeah. If he can, if someone can knows anybody that can reach him, because he to to help him change his vote, because it's I think on Wednesday. Is it tomorrow morning? Is it tomorrow morning? Yeah. So if you click that link on the right, it'll take you to your local representatives. And it's very easy. You send a letter to every single local representative uh, based on your zip code. OK, so I think we're pretty much done. It, it was a very long evening. So thank you all for joining us. Um, just we already talked about these calls to actions. All of you probably have seen these papers on your seat. These are some ideas of how to get started in your advocacy for Palestine. Um, we'd like to also encourage you all to download the Boycat app. B-O-Y-C-A-T. Uh, that one is now the official BDS partner. Um, so it's a really good app to download. And our tablers are still outside. So please do engage with them if you haven't already. We have Project Hope for Palestine, which is, yes, uh, is running it. They are on the ground in Gaza and in the West Bank, right? Um, and we also have Heal Palestine, which does a lot of medical evacuations for children in Palestine. Um, so with that, uh, thank you all for joining us and have a good evening.